So hello everyone and welcome for today's session. I am Durgesh Chandel. I am a postdoctoral researcher at MIT and I recently started a new role at Intel Corporation as a resolution enhancement technology designer. Uh, so today we have gathered here to uh, you know, benefit from another session of WeLeap. WeLeap is nothing but an abbreviation for women leaders in aerospace and mechanical engineering programs. And that inspiration is coming from my educational background. I have aerospace degree from, uh, the undergraduate degrees are from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur. And then I moved to Minnesota for my PhD. And then I moved to MIT for my postdoctoral research. So of course, uh, these specifically these two branches and women in STEM in general, you know, don't have enough mentors and enough connections to figure out about how to prepare for MS and PhD applications and, you know, anything related to higher studies. So the mission here is to provide high quality STEM mentorship for everybody coming from minority or underrepresented communities or even for developing countries. So I'm so glad that you all are here today. And we have, um, so this is the first panel session of our We Leap Empowering Panels. And today we have a hand-picked set of uh, four speakers who are coming from different educational backgrounds and different timelines of their, ex, um, you know, uh, applications into MS and PhD programs. And they have recently made their way into top US universities. So today we will hear from them. Uh, first, we will go through uh, some of their background and some basic information about how they proceeded about their applications, et cetera. And then we will have a structured question and answer session from our interviewer, uh, Ms. Ankita Avasti. She is a student in IIT Bhilai and she's also a part of our executive team. So she will be conducting the interview. And after that, we will have a live question and answers from the audience. So yeah, be, be ready with your questions. And in the meantime, we will be putting some links in the chat uh, for you to connect with us. So keep, uh, keep checking that. So with that, uh, I will start uh, handing over to our first speaker, Shreya. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Shreya Sharma, and I am also an outreach coordinator for Vili. And my background is as follows. You can see on the slide, I am an incoming PhD student at MIT. I applied uh, for this fall 22 session. And uh, my journey to application has been that I did a four years bachelor's degree and a two year master's degree. And I worked for two years in an aerospace related company. And the details you can see on the slide, which I will maybe explain in in any upcoming question. Oh, next one. And uh, some more details about uh, my timeline, et cetera. I think for me, uh, I knew that I wanted to apply to grad school uh, right during my master's, but I did not apply that year. I took some time like in 2019 and 20 to figure out the process and understand which exams I had to take and kind of research about which universities to apply. And 2021 December, which is uh, for the fall 2022 session is when I finally applied. My criteria was that, uh, of course, I wanted a mix of ambitious, moderate and safe schools. And I placed a lot of, lot of emphasis on applying to those schools where they were doing the kind of research which I had either already done or I wanted to do. So I looked into research groups and things like that. And uh, briefly, this is the success rate, as you can see, uh, three places I got through with funding and four places I got through without uh, funding. And uh, I was rejected from four schools. I applied to a lot of schools. You can see around 13 schools uh, and two schools. Since I had already made my decision, I kind of withdrew from their uh, process. So I don't know if it's, I don't know if they would have accepted or rejected me. And the main criteria for me personally was that uh, I wanted to go to a school which was highly ranked and uh, thankfully I got an admit in such a school and also I think it's very important to talk to advisor and more important to talk to current graduate students to find out how the situation is in your lab and whether you fit in whether the social life of the lab is such that you want to spend your uh, next four or five years of your PhD there so that is my introduction in brief. thank you that's cool welcome to MIT Shreya Thank you, Dubesh. Okay, let's go to Adi. 
Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Adi. I'm a PhD candidate in aerospace engineering at the University of Illinois. I did my bachelor's also in aerospace engineering at Amrita University, uh, Kaimatur in India. I'm currently working on some experimental turbulence research. And before coming to UIUC, I was a project associate at the Indian Institute of Technology in Madras in the Rarified Gas Dynamics Laboratory, where I was working on some experimental high speed flows. And for my bachelor's, I did some research on um, high performance polymers so in, in the area of composite materials. And during my undergrad, I did one research internship in Aircraft Research Design Center in Henderson Aeronautics Limited, Bangalore. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, we have something about my grad school application timeline. Uh, my time frame was relatively long, um, kind of like what Shreya mentioned, I started quite early because one, I wanted to take things slow and I also had some unexpected delays in terms of visa. Um, so I ended up enrolling for uh, fall 2018. I actually enrolled for a master's program and I transitioned to the direct PhD program, which is the program I'm in right now in May 2019, uh, once my advisor offered to have me shift in. Um, the universities that I applied to were UIUC, Texas A&M, University of Maryland, Penn State, Iowa State, Arizona State. And the criteria that I considered was one, it, uh, the university need, needed to have, or the department needed to have interesting experimental fluids or aerodynamics research, which is the thing that I'm interested in and I'm still working on. And I also considered my chances of getting admitted, considering my profile, chances of me getting funded. Um, if you have some issues with my internet, um, if you can't hear me over the just let me know. Uh, and I also considered relevant coursework that was offered in the university. And that's how I ended up choosing UIUC because there were multiple professors um, who were working in the area that I was interested in. I wanted to do a master's with thesis. I wanted to do a PhD. So I wanted to have a research advisor. So I chose a university where there are many professors working in the area that I was interested in. And I also looked at relevant uh, coursework that was offered in the university. Um, out of the six universities I applied to, I uh, got accepted into four. Uh, I got rejected from Texas A&M and Penn State. Um, yeah, I'll leave, leave the rest for the questions and answers. Thank you, Adi. That's really interesting. We're looking forward to get more about you. Okay, let's go to Jasmine. So hi, everyone. My name is Jasmine. I'll be an incoming PhD student at Aero Astro MIT this fall. I finished my BTEC and MTech dual degree in aerospace engineering from IIT Kharagpur, uh, graduated in May 2022. Uh, since I don't have work experience, I've listed my research experience here. So I participated in the Robotics Institute Summer Scholar Program in 2021 remotely from CMU and MITAC's Global Link Research Internship in 2021 from McGill. And in 2020, uh, I was a research intern at IIC and also I could do during the summer DARDWISE 2020 research internship uh, remotely from TU Des Dresden. Durgesh, can you go to the next? Yeah, thank you. So here, my application timeframe was uh, all during the last, uh, last year is July to December itself. Uh, July to August, a uh, list of universities, uh, and by August to September, I made a list, confirmed my letter writers, and started completing my resume. Uh, September to October, I had to give one GRE score, so I ha had to prepare for it anyway, but TOEFL was required for all my applications, and by November, I completed my SOP and then gave them out to review, and by December, the deadlines completed the application. It was a little last minute, but I still somehow managed it. I applied to MIT, Stanford, CMU, UC Berkeley, Cornell, Washington, UW, and you, you can see the list. But I selected these primarily based on the best fit to research profile and the research goals. And my third criteria was course and program objectives. Uh, I got admission from, in, uh, from Sef, I got admission offers from seven of them and rejected from UMich and University of Toronto. The, uh, I observed that the fit with my research profile and the current research done at the universities that didn't accept me wasn't as good as the ones that did accept me. And once I got these offers, the choice was dependent on how 
uh, advisor student match. That was my primary criteria. The choice of projects, how flexible the lab uh, research directions are, the funding guarantees, and how the graduate student support system would be in a particular unit department. So yeah, this uh, I'll leave the rest for question and answers. Thank you. That was very useful. Okay, and welcome to MIT, Jasmine. <laughs> Thank you, Dogesh. Let's go to the well, last but not least speaker today, Nandita. Um, hi, everyone. Um, <clears throat> I think I'm on the other side <laughs> uh, of, of the study part now. But um, right now, I'm uh, working, or I actually recently joined as a research scientist at uh, Amazon Primer. Uh, and before that, I just graduated actually this May with a PhD um, uh, from Virginia Tech. Uh, and before that, I uh, did my master's uh, again in aerospace engineering from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. And I did my bachelor's uh, from Amrita University um, in Coimbatore. Um, so I've, uh, yeah, I've fairly been in, in uh, the aerodynamics uh, uh, field and, and primarily uh, experimental. And some of the research that I've not included in this uh, in this slide also include um, actually um, my summer internship at Texas a and um, and also uh, kind of a short period where I was working with Airbus India. Uh, so so that's not so so much counted as uh, industry experience, but I, I uh, decided to to uh, work a bit before uh, jumping on to to my uh, PhD. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I also did an internship with uh, with IIT Kanpur. Again, I'm not mentioned here, uh, uh, but that was also a research internship uh, versus an industry. Okay. Yeah. Next slide. Uh, so I haven't really added a lot of statistics here, but I'm uh, I'll take that time to speak about it. So my uh, grad school application actually I um, I initially intended to come for my masters. Uh, so I had actually started, did my GRE, my TOEFL during my last year of, of my bachelor's. Uh, and I applied to a uh, very selected college colleges, uh, but that time I did not get funding in any. Um, uh, so I decided to, uh, and, and, and unfortunately I also did my gate exam. And so I, I got into IISC, which had been my dream. So it, it worked out anyway. Uh, but, uh, but yes, I, what I, what I basically want to say is that I took my time, uh, to kind of find out, do my research, did my GRE, TOEFL, and then again, took some time to research, uh, about what university is kind of finding out and everything, uh, which, which I realized having this panel right now is so helpful because at that time I had absolutely no clue. Uh, and from the, the universities I applied, you can see how conservative I was. Uh, in terms of not even, you know, trying to apply for a lot of universities, just select few where I was like super sure that this is the professors I want to work with. Uh, so I was very conservative, and I'm I'm fortunate I got into to Texas a and uh, so to Virginia Tech and Texas a and uh, But <clears throat> but again, uh, uh, I would like strongly recommend for all of us who have like all of you to have both ambitious, like targeted, all kind of, you know, mixture of universities that you can, you can apply to. Uh, another important uh, criteria for me was funding. Um, mm. uh, and that was absolutely necessary for me, which is also why I was super conservative in terms of, uh, uh, you know, trying to apply. Uh, and I think since I was applying for my PhD, the second time, uh, the main criteria was again, research, right, uh, which a lot of you would understand in terms of uh, uh, masters, you have maybe a, a bit of a broader uh, 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 set of points, uh, which probably we'll be discussing. But for me, uh, while I was applying for my PhD, it was research and, and second was funding. Um, and uh, my success rate was 50% considering the number of universities I had applied was actually four. I'm not uh, uh, added Michigan University here. Uh, and I got through for, from two and, and I got rejected uh, in the other two. Uh, but uh, in general, I, I find that maintaining good, maintaining good standing in academics and then uh, also networking really helps. Uh, and I'll be happy to answer and talk about more uh, in, the, in the following uh, session. In, in the Thank session. you, Tandika. Yeah. Your story is very similar to mine. I also took my time and, you know, like I worked three years before I started PhD. And also I one thing I really needed was the funding. So, yeah, very 
I see so many similarities. Thank you. So yeah, thank you all for introducing yourself. And now I will open the floor for questions. So I will hand it over to Ankita to start having some structured Q and A, and then we will move to audience Q and A. Hi everyone! Again, welcome to We Leaves Vidna. Thank you for joining us. And let's start with the first question. Any of you can answer it. That what was the timeline of your preparation for the application to the programs? I can go. Um, I briefly spoke about this already, um, but. I had been working on choosing universities for like the better part of my undergrad. Um, just thinking about like different universities that uh, that did consider at some level the ranking of these universities and also research and things like that. And I readied my application package about three months before submission. So I had taken my GRE and TOEFL far before um, starting my starting to put my application package together. And I submitted the applications a couple of days to one month before the deadline. And I appeared for the visa interview soon after, and I took a little bit of time and uh, it took a little bit of time actually uh, for me to get my visa. And then I enrolled for college. Thank you. So how do we decide which universities to shortlist? Because we can't actually go by the ranking that is available on like in India, it has NIRFs and some websites have their own rankings. But how, how what would be your recommendation to shortlist our colleges? Yeah, I um, also follow the thing that everybody follows, which is uh, two safe universities, two moderate, two, um, you know, a couple of them. And I chose two as a number, so two safe, two moderate, and two ambitious. Um, and it's true that you don't always look at rankings alone. Um, I also considered my profile uh, and where I'd fit in better, of course, the research that was being conducted in the universities, uh, my chances of getting funded. Um, yeah, so I think one, one, one way to evaluate whether you whether a university is like ambitious to you uh, or safe to you is, of course, like the objectifiable measures. You have things like, um, what kind of letters of recommendation you would get? Like, would it would they be glowing or would they be from professors who kind of know you? Uh, or what your GPA is, what your GRE scores are, like all the standard scores and things like that. That's on one side. And on the other side, um, I also considered like what my self-worth and how I how confident I was in my abilities to get into the university, to get funded, uh, to convince somebody that I know something. So um those are the kind of criteria that I considered when choosing my university. Okay, so let's move forward to the next one, which is that who would be the best people to approach for a letter of recommendation? Because it happens to be a very important thing while you're applying towards a university for your higher studies. So what would be your response on that? Uh, I can take that. Um, so the best person for who to write a recommendation for you is someone who knows your work, who knows how, who you are as a person and who, know, who knows that you are serious about applying to grad school. And at least you should have had two to three discussions with them that you want to apply to universities, what your goals are, what your post PhD or post MS plans are. So ideally it should be your, if you are applying after a master's say then it should be your research advisor during your master's. And if you're applying after your bachelor's, if you've done any projects or internships, then it should be that person. It should be someone. And I feel the ranking of the person, not ranking, the yeah, the the designation of the person does not matter that much. I think it matters how well the professor knows you and how much he can vouch for you. And if if you do not have such experiences, in that case, you should go for someone under whom you've taken courses. But that should that will not count as a very strong recommendation. That is fine. If I may also add, uh, so if I may also add to this, so uh, uh, definitely go with professors who would be able to give anecdotes about you, so that they could vouch for you better and give you a better uh, impression to the le uh, letter readers, and also decide uh, how much information the professors need to share and try to refresh their memory as well in case they forgot what it was like to work with you. Uh, yeah, that would be my point. Okay, thank you, Jasmine and Shreya. 
So the next question is also based on the question that was popped up in the chat box that is a high GPA mandatory? Like what if in a person's case, they are not in the top 10% of their class. So what should they be doing? And how much should they be worrying about this section? Yeah, I can, <clears throat> I can get started with that. Uh, so I think uh, GPA is important to some extent, at least, you know, uh, uh, I think the first kind of screening that happens, which is probably not a, a, a manual one, which like probably the professor doesn't do it. I think that requires a certain uh, 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 GPA as suggested by like different schools. But having said that, uh, don't let your GPA govern the fact that you want to go for higher studies or not. So what I'm trying to say is based on your GPA, there are definitely like different options that you can apply to. And even after that, you can like, I would super recommend having ambitious colleges on your list too. Uh, but, but having said that, keep in mind to, to make sure you have some safe schools that, that, you know, you have in mind. So, uh, so it's always better to have a good GPA because that kind of ensures you that you go through the first screening without any anybody's intervention, uh, especially for masters. For for PhD, there is, uh, you know, there's often the research advisor and and maybe a more personal touch that comes in uh, into your application. But uh, when it comes to your masters, uh, a lot of times people apply not with the, not knowing whom they're going to be working with or what they're going to what they're going to be working with. It, it's more more like co space. Uh, in that in that uh, case. It you know it GPA does become kind of important for the first screening, uh, but again, uh, uh, depending on whatever your GPA is, there are like many options. So I know uh, so many people, a uh, uh, lot of my peers, everybody with different GPA ranges, ha all applying to Europe and US colleges. So never let that be your barrier. Uh, just be, just choose wisely. That that that's uh, what my recommendation would be. Um, if I can add something um, yeah. and ask for what to do if you don't have like a great GPA, I think there are other areas where you can strengthen your application, you can uh, take up research projects, you can get some experience writing papers. I know that's not like super common in undergrad, but um, any experience is a great experience. So if you can take any opportunity, even if it's not something that would end up on your resume, I think at some level it will benefit you and it will show in the conversations that you have in class or with the professor. So I think in general, it's it's important to take up any opportunity that you get um, to strengthen your application, even if it does not seem obvious that this is where to strengthen your application. I would just like to add something based on my experience. So yeah, th that was a good advice, Adi. Uh, because when I applied, uh, everybody in my class, like only the people who had the 10 GPA all the time, like in IITK, we have 10 system, 10 by 10. So only they were applying to all the biggest schools like Caltech, Stanford, MIT. And I was like, you know, um, so intimidated that time. I felt like maybe I'm not good enough. So then that's why I went towards getting some work experience and make my profile uh, you know, comparable to them. And that really helped. So that's, that's an advice for everybody. Okay. okay so moving forward to the third section of your application that is known to be very important. That is that is research experience necessary to apply to graduate schools? Does it depend if our program is a PhD or masters and uh, should we have publications already? Uh, yeah, I can start with that. So I I won't speak about the master's applications, but since I applied to PhD, I think since you will be doing research and your professor basically will choose students who he thinks will be able to do good research, I think, uh, I won't say mandatory, because even on the websites, they say that it's not mandatory, but it's good to have. Mm -hmm. So it is important that you have some good research experience and you are able to show that in your SOP or in any other material that you have you have made some progress or you have at least understood what it means to do research and you like doing research and the second part uh, is it necessary to have publications i think it is not necessary but again i think if you if you apply to a university and everyone else has a publication in a good 
place ultimately they will judge you against your peers so if if at all possible i think you should try to get a publication out and from my personal experience i since i worked i i actually took that time to also get my paper published and in my experience, in my case i believe uh, it really helped that i had the publication but of course it's not mandatory at all thank you sir so is work experience required to get accepted to a graduate program i'm just going to say no as far as um, i know yeah I, yeah, yeah I, not not in in yeah uh, i don't think it's important i definitely think anything that you have would be an add on to your resume uh, but it's not going to be a deciding factor so um, yeah so how early can we contact potential professors before applying to a university is it mandatory to, to get a positive response from them to apply i could take a shot at this answer um so you could start as early as the summer of the applying year and uh, reach out to professors and uh, sometimes you may or may not get responses i have noted a lot of professors that i wanted to apply mention on their website do not reach out unless you are admitted so that also was another uh, factor in deciding whether to email them or not but um, i gave an email sent an email anyway the other factor uh, that i would say is probably some most most of the time some admissions might happen with an admissions committee rather than a professor deciding who is going to pick students for uh, the phd cohort so um, it would be always beneficial to apply if you have two or three professors from a particular department that you really want to work with and apply to the department irrespective of hearing back from the department or professor so yeah that would be my advice yeah, thank you jasmine so when we are applying to higher studies universities so we are already competing with the best of this so how can we make our sop stand out from the crowd not make it look like a very basic sop but like something that somebody would pick uh, out of the crowd 